So I would like to um, introduce our next speaker. We have Dr. Richard Horowitz. He is a founding member of ILADS and a board certified internist in private, and has a private practice in Hyde Park. He is a medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center and he's treated over 12,000 chronic Lyme disease patients over the last 29 years. He's one of the founding members and past president-elect of ILADS and is a published author. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Richard Horowitz. Oh, thank you so much. Can you hear me in the back? They told me there was problems. Great. You got it? Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here. I can't remember. Is this my third or my fourth time? Fourth time. Wow, time flies. Um, Every year I speak, what's kind of nice about doing this, for those of you who attended the prior talks, there's always new information. And fortunately, we have several new publications to share with you. So one of the things I'll be doing during the slide lecture today is giving you some of the updates that's been happening um, in the medical literature, and also some updates um, with Health and Human Services. So what was not mentioned, and I will have this on my next slide, but I was elected to the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, so I'm one of seven public members working now um, with members of the CDC, the NIH, the Department of Defense, and the FDA to try and solve the epidemic for our country, and Whoa. Congress will be getting it. So Congress will be getting a report by the end of this year, and just yesterday afternoon at five o'clock, we finished our report. So this was a 10-week marathon. It was kind of like when I was in college, having midterms and finals every week. Um, we had an amazing group of people. There were 11 of us serving on the committee. Um, there were members of the CDC, Chris Paddock. We had members of the NIH, Sam Perdue, uh, Department of Defense, Alan Richards. So this was a large grouping of people from both the federal and the public side. And I can tell you that um, it went very well. We had very honest conversations, and our document that will be up on the HHS website should be up very shortly. So if you've never gone on the HH site, it's hhs.gov, Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. The uh, reports, there were six subcommittees, they will be up very shortly, because by federal law, we had to have them up by five o'clock yesterday afternoon and uh, at least submitted. We looked on the site just an hour ago. They're not up yet, but they will be up very shortly. And uh, our committee report, just to let you know, because I was the co-chair of the other tick-borne diseases and co-infections committee, uh, which by this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about co-infections, but maybe I can do a little bit more with question and answers. But um, the co-infections are becoming, and other tick-borne infections are becoming a really big problem. Um, Ron talked about it a little bit, but you should know that a lot of the fatalities that we see in this country um, are not just related to Lyme, they're due to young children under the age of 10 years old who get Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever because doctors don't know that you're allowed to give doxycycline to children under the eight, age of eight years old. It does not cause tooth staining, okay? Same thing in pregnancy. Pregnant women are allowed to take short courses of doxycycline. So the literature keeps evolving and what you'll see in this report is a lot of the updated literature on anaplasma, ehrlichia, uh, Borrelia miyamotoi, relapsing fever, Borrelia sensulatu species, which are cousins of Lyme disease, which cause Lyme-like syndromes. So I'm not gonna highlight that so much in the talk today, but perhaps in the question and answer, if you have questions about this, we'll, we'll go through it a bit. So, I'm just gonna keep making that sound and see what happens. Go down, yes. Uh, so there's several conflicts of interest uh, I have two books that I have written on the Zymogen Board of Advisors. We've received grants from Bay Area Lyme and uh, Romark Pharmaceuticals will be doing a study with us very shortly um, on a new um, way of using Alinea. They have a new kind of formulation of Alinea that gets better penetration into the body. But the main thing you need to know about the talk today is that the views that you're going to hear during my presentation do not express the views of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, HHS, or the United States. So the lawyers of HHS are now very happy that I put this in all of my slides when I speak in front of people. Okay, so the teaching objectives today of what I'm going to share with you is to learn about the clinical disorders 
um, which are mimicked by Lyme disease, how infections and toxins drive inflammation. So one of the things I want to highlight, and this just came out, by the way, in a paper that Dr. Freeman and I, Dr. Phyllis Freeman, by the way, is here. For most of you who know my books or anything I have published, it would not at all be possible without the help of Dr. Phyllis Freeman, who's here in the front. Uh, Phyllis has been a very close friend and a sister to me for the last 30 years and been very, very helpful. So um, we published a paper and it just came out last night. So for those of you who did not see it, it was on my Facebook page. Uh, and it's about, I'll show it to you during the slides. It's about treating a young man with chronic variable immune deficiency uh, with embryonic stem cell therapies. And as we look for answers for people with Lyme disease, I will tell you we have a paper that we expect to get out by the end of the year. There is a lot of immune deficiency in people who have Lyme. And it's a question of where does this immune deficiency come from? In other words, why is it difficult to get rid of these bacteria or these parasites like Babesia or some of the viruses? And in part, it's from the immune dysfunction. And some is caused by Lyme disease. Um, anaplasma also causes an immune deficiency. It affects the way our neutrophils um, act and are able to get the bacteria in our body. We see immune dysfunction from Bartonella. Ron was telling you about it. It definitely causes immune deficiency. It is a persister bacteria that can hide inside the cells um, and will come out after you stop treatment. So many of these bacteria do cause immune deficiency and autoimmune phenomenon. Lyme is well known that it does it, but so do the environmental toxins that we're exposed to. And you'll see in the article that we just published last night, um, on this young gentleman, we do highlight, and I'll talk to you about it in the slides, that when you're treating people now who have inflammation, and for those of you who've had Lyme disease who complain of fatigue, joint pain, muscle pain, headaches, memory problems, mood swings, sleep disorders, I can't fall asleep, I keep waking up in the middle of the night, all of the symptoms that I just described are due to inflammatory molecules called cytokines or chemokines. And these molecules are what are responsible for these syndromes, but you can get the same inflammation from eating the wrong foods. If you have leaky gut and food allergies or mast cell activation disorder, you get exactly the same molecules that are produced. If you don't fall asleep at night, you get high levels of interleukin-6, one of these molecules that causes inflammation. If you have the wrong bacteria in your gut, which is called dysbiosis, you can get some of these wrong molecules being produced. And in fact, now the bacteria in our gut are now being linked up to Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, different forms of cancer, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder. So the microbiome of the gut and stem cells is kind of, I think, some of the new horizons where medicine is looking to find answers. And I'll discuss that a little bit in the talk. But these toxins that are getting in, I will tell you, apart from my discussing Lyme today, are really playing a large role. So you'll see in some of the slides I'm going to discuss with you about how infections and toxins are driving an inflammatory response in a lot of these different diseases that we see. Whether you call it chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, right, which is 5% of the U.S. population. Now, is there a test for chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia? No. no. It's a clinical diagnosis. You're tired. You have aches and pains. You have headaches. You have memory problems. You can't fall asleep. And your autonomic nervous system, the part of your body that relates to helping your blood pressure to maintain standing up or affected, well, those are exactly the same symptoms you see with Lyme disease, right? It's the same problem where you're looking at Alzheimer's. And I'll show you this. They're now finding Lyme spirochetes under biofilms in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. Now, that doesn't mean if you have Lyme, you're going to get Alzheimer's because they've also found chlamydia pneumonia. They have found Helicobacter pylori, the bacteria in our stomach. They found Porphyromonas gingivalis, the bacteria under the biofilms of your teeth. If you don't go to your dentist, your mother said floss and brush and make sure you get to the dentist, those bacteria are now showing up in biofilms in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. So where I want to expand out this knowledge of Lyme today is to let you know that in a lot of other diseases, autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, many of these different diseases, there can be a bacterial component on top of environmental toxins as well as genetics that's playing a role, and therefore the take-home point is with everything I'm going to show you today, just to make sure you're not just looking at Lyme, you're looking at the co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella, which I will highlight. Those are probably two of the worst infections apart from mycoplasma species that are driving an inflammatory response. 
But make sure also, as I said, you're looking at your diet, you're looking at the microbiome, you're looking at getting to sleep, you're looking at all these overlapping sources of inflammation like toxins, and then you have to treat the downstream effects of the infections and the toxins. They damage the mitochondria of your cells that give you energy or help your heart to function properly or your nerve cells and your brain to function properly. It can affect the autonomic nervous system where, again, I have young people who come in. I'll give you a perfect story. Let's see how much actually you've learned about Lyme. You'll see this during the presentation. A young woman, she's 15 years old. She comes to my practice. Um, her mother flies her up from the South uh, United States and she has this history. She's 15 years old. She has tremendous pain. Her pain is so bad, she's on 480 milligrams of morphine sulfate. Yeah, you know, that's a large dose. And her pain is not controlled. She's in a wheelchair. She can't get up out of the wheelchair. She can't walk. She's having ongoing seizures. She can't eat. She can't sleep. She can't go to the bathroom on her own. And the mother contacts me on Facebook and says, my daughter's dying. If you don't see her, she is definitely going to die. Now, for those of you who had Jewish mothers, I am good at guilt. <laughs> guilt me that your daughter's going to die if you don't fly her up to see me. That doesn't mean, by the way, contact me after this, Doc, I'm going to die, okay? But they, she did fly up to see me. And we do a history and physical on a young woman. So she fills out the questionnaire I'm about to show you, the HMQ, the horowitz Emsons questionnaire. We validated this questionnaire. For those of you who've been here before, you heard me talk about this questionnaire before. It finally got published at the end of this past year. Um, this was a three-year study. I mean, Phyllis will tell you, this was a bear of a study to get published. It was 1,600 people. We validated it. She filled out the questionnaire. Question one, 15 years old. Do you have day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing? The answer was yes. What does she have? Babesium. That's right. If it was a man, would he have menopause? No. Bad joke, folks. Just keep it. Ahead. I asked her about her pain. I said, does your pain migrate around your body? Ron talked about this. I'll show you in the paper that migratory joint pain, migratory muscle pain, migratory nerve pain, that tingling, numbness, burning, stabbing sensation you get, classic for Lyme disease. We did a statistical analysis and showed um, there's only seven other diseases in the medical literature where this happens, and Lyme is the only one where the nerve pain migrates around the body. She said, yes, I have migratory pain. I said, okay, Lyme is likely. I examine her, and she's got stretch marks, or what look like stretch marks or striae, above her breasts, on her flanks, and on her buttocks. What does she have? Bartonella, excellent. And then her mother and I try and stand her up out of the wheelchair. Her blood pressure before we stood her up was 90 over 60 with a pulse of 90. We stand her up out of the wheelchair and I can't hear her blood pressure within one minute with a heart rate that goes up 40 points to about 130. What does she have? Pots dysautonomia. Did I do a blood test? Did I diagnose her based on a history and physical examination? Yes. That is what is taught, by the way, in medical school. That is what we learned, and that's what's been taught in medicine for the last 150 years. That by history, you can determine the diagnosis in 90% of the patients. So she left the office. I put her on doxycycline and rifampin, two intracellular drugs. How many doctors and um, healthcare providers are in the audience? Please raise your hands. Great, I'm gonna go through some of the protocols just so you're clear when you leave here today about some of the basic protocols. I know Ron was describing them. So she went on doxycycline and rifampin, which is a very classic combo that we use all the time. We find that one intracellular drug these days just generally does not work for Lyme-associated co-infections. I gave her malarone and artemisia for the babesium. I gave her Florinef, a drug that raises your blood pressure, with salt and fluids and some licorice, real licorice, which raises your pressure. She comes in one month later, she's walking out of the wheelchair, she's off her morphine, she has no pain, her seizures are completely gone, and she's going to Broadway shows and going out with her friends all the time and has no symptoms. She saw eight doctors in the South, four infectious disease doctors, several neurologists, primary care, nobody could figure out what was wrong with this young girl. I gave her the questionnaire, and I simply said, let's do the screening, and let's interpret and see what it means when we do this. So it's very important that you understand that taking a look at this questionnaire and the symptoms are number one, the most important. The second we're gonna do is I'll show you about the lab testing. 
But I think most of you already know the lab testing is unreliable, right? I'll go through the scientific literature just so I can show it to you, but let's just say that the hallmark, and Ron was going through this a bit with the bands on the Western block, is you've got to play the game line bingo with the people who come into your office, right? 23 outer surface protein C, 31 outer surface protein A, unless you've got mononucleosis, possibly um, other infections, viral infections, but most of the time it's still Lyme. Um, Igenex has a 31 epitope test to distinguish between the two. 34, outer surface protein B. 39, very specific, Ron was talking about it. 83, 93. Those are your Lyme-specific bands. Now, because I'm also going to share with you that there are other Borrelia species in the United States, they're called Borrelia sensulatu and relapsing fever Borrelia, like Borrelia miyamotoi. These Borrelia will not be picked up on the two-tier testing of using an ELISA followed by a Western blot. So if you do a Western blot and you see any of these numbers, these bands, the proteins on the outside of the bacteria, that means you've been exposed to at least a Borrelia species. It may not be Borrelia burgdorferi sensu strictu, the organism that causes Lyme, but it could be a sensu latu species, and sensu latu means that there's other Borrelia that cause human disease. Borrelia abzelli in Europe, it causes a rash called acrodermatitis chronic amitrophicans. Please repeat that three times faster. <laughs> Borrelia carini, neuroborreliosis, Borrelia valsani. There are all of these different Borrelia species, and in California, they've got some new species that just showed up. So they've got, for example, Borrelia lani. They named it after Bob Lane, excellent Lyme researcher. I hope I never find a tick and they name it after me. <laughs> Borrelia horowitzia, I mean, it's like, it, it get ridiculous. So they're discovering all of these different Borrelia species across the United States, including in the south. In the south, in the southeast United States, where they've got star eyes, southern tick-associated rash illness. They're still not really sure even what the Borrelia species is, but they are finding these other type of sensulatu species that are making people sick. And some of those pa patients get Lyme carditis. Right? There, the CDC reported Lyme carditis cases where some of these people died, right, from third degree heart block. Um, one of the patients actually was in my area, Joseph Filoni. And for those of you who attended uh, the Binghamton lecture a couple of years ago, Mary Stewart Masterson and Jeremy were here. They actually produced a play based on the Filoni story called The Little Things. And um, it, it's a very touching story for those of you who have not seen it. Um, in any case, what's happening now is these Borrelia species are spreading. So the point is, don't rely on the lab tests. I'm gonna show you the MSITS map. I've been doing this now at this point, it was mentioned 12,000, we actually made it over 13,000 at this year. The MSITS map, the 16 point map that I think most of you are familiar with, it really for me is an easy way to figure out in a complicated case where you're going with the differential diagnosis because if you take out the 16 points and you're with someone, or if you're a patient, you can do this with your physician. You just go down the list, piece by piece, taking a look at all of the 16 points to figure out which are the most important. And again, I'm gonna show you later on in the slides how you kind of condense them down and you think about it in ways that will make sense to you. Then after you go through the MSIDS map, and you've done a differential diagnosis, you've taken a history, you do a differential diagnosis, you're gonna create a treatment plan. You have to prioritize the most important points of the treatment. I will tell you the most important points generally after all these years of doing this is not just treating the Lyme. And again, you have to know the individual wiring of whoever it is you're treating. So for example, some people may respond wonderfully to a penicillin or to a cephalosporin like ceftin or omnicef or ibirocephal because the organism Borrelia has cell wall forms. But sometimes in people, some people don't respond at all to cell wall drugs. They only respond to intracellular drugs, like doxycycline, like rifampin, like macrolides, like biaxin or zithromax, like quinolones, right? Or some of these new mycobacterium drugs that we're using that I'm gonna tell you about at the end of the lecture, dapsone and pyrazinamide, right? So you have to understand that if you give a medicine to a patient, and I'm speaking to the healthcare providers here, and they have no response whatsoever that either means that you're either not treating the right infection or you might not be treating the right form of the bug or hitting a co-infection that's in the body. 
But on the other hand, let's say you give doxycycline and someone has a Herxheimer reaction, right? You're killing off the bacteria. If that patient says, I feel better after they're done with the Herx, they had a good Herx, great. But if they're on a drug and all they do is have bad Herxes, you stop the drug and they're back to the same place they started, you're gonna to have to find another rotation. Where I'm going with this is, is it has to be personalized treatment. Every treatment response you're gonna do is personalized. So as a physician or healthcare provider, you're gonna take a history. If you give them a macrolide like Zithromax, do they get better? Do they get worse with a Herx or is there no reaction? Because you're gonna end up combining a lot of these drugs in combination and you wanna know the most effective combos for that particular patient and realize what's gonna happen over time. These bugs are clever. A regimen will work for a while and it's gonna stop working. Rotate. The patient will tell you what to do. You're not gonna tell them what to do. Their body and the response to the treatment tells you how to go through the maze you just have to keep going back to the 16-point map. We're gonna talk about the overlapping sources of inflammation and how important that is, and then I'm gonna tell you about some new cutting-edge integrative and classical protocols for this. This is what we will not be discussing today. Um, I find this interesting because I don't think I've ever at this point in the last 30 years had anybody who's come to my office with perfect health. Um, what we are discussing is a lot of people who get sick from what's going on now in the environment. Now, you know that the CDC this past week just came out with their report, their vital signs, that we had a tripling at this point in the last 12, 13 years of ticks, mosquitoes, fleas basically going up. So it's not just the figures that there was a tenfold increase, right, from 300, basically it went from and they're estimating here, 329,000 to 400,000 is the estimate of the number of cases in the US, right? But this is still a tripling in the last 12 years. It's going very fast. And the reason fleas, by the way, is important is because when I briefly discuss Bartonella with you today, probably the majority of the people who get Bartonella are getting it from cat fleas and from flea bites, okay? They're not getting it from ticks. It doesn't mean it's not found in ticks. Ixodes ricinus ticks in Europe, Ixodes ticks contain Bartonella. There are some articles in the medical literature, Rice et al. in 2012 published one of them. But there's not a lot on transmission of Bart by Ixodes ticks, but there is some. But probably most of it is because you're getting probably exposure to fleas, but it's also mites and it's biting flies and they're looking into mosquitoes and spiders and other forms. So Bartonella can be transmitted through multiple sources. So the changes in predators in the environment, like the white-footed mouse, the reason we're seeing so many more is because the coyote population is going up, the foxes go down, and the mice population is starting to go up. The ticks have emerged three weeks earlier. So although May is Lyme Awareness Month, some people have suggested actually we make it April um, because with climate change and things getting warmer earlier, although this was kind of a late spring, um, <laughs> thank God this week it finally changed. Um, we are seeing the ticks come out a lot earlier. And by the way, this is be clear about this, ticks are around every day of the year. Please be aware in the winter time, you get a 42 degree day or higher, the ticks are out biting. So you cannot assume that just because it's the middle of the winter time, if you have a warm day, you're not gonna get a tick bite. And it's the same thing, by the way, for the co-infections. So be very, very careful with it because, for example, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which most people think of, oh, that's the Rocky Mountains, right? Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is also in the southwestern United States, but it's across the whole northern hemisphere. So you have to realize that these ticks are spreading. The Lone Star tick has now spread, right? Regular Exodes ticks, they come running about 12, 15 feet away. They smell your carbon dioxide and your heat signature. So the, the Lone Star ticks, they come from 50 feet away. You don't have to be gardening or in the woods. They will come from far away, right? And they're not containing Lyme, but they're containing a whole boast, bunch of other infections that can make you sick. So these type of ticks with different infections are now spreading across the United States. The modes of transmission are increasing. So for example, the relapsing fever Borrelia, Borrelia miyamotoi, part of the reason it's increasing, it has trans ovarial transmission. That means that a mother tick does not need to feed off of an animal. It means that she's transmitting six to 73% of the time those spirochetes in her eggs that are then starting to become the larvae and the nymphs and the adults. So right now, you must consider, just like you would think, the most common tick-borne infections are Lyme disease, anaplasma, 
Babesia, that was the three we would say probably are some of the most common. Borrelia miyamotoi is now right up there. If you go to California to the Bay Area and you take those ticks, Ixodes specificus ticks, you'll find the same number of now Borrelia burgdorferi, Lyme disease, and Borrelia miyamotoi, relapsing fever, found in those ticks. Why do I highlight this? The two-tier testing for Lyme disease does not pick up Borrelia miyamotoi. So you can have a Lyme-like syndrome, fatigue, joint pain, muscle pain, headaches, mood swings, sleep disorder. The doctors, you do the testing, it's negative. Think if it's possibly a relapsing fever or a sensulatu species that you may not pick up, right, on the standard two-tier testing. Um, modes of human transmission. Some of these are in the blood supply. Anaplasma. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Babesia, Bartonella, these are all transmitted at this point through the blood transfusion process. So the FDA just approved a couple of months ago a Babesia microti testing, and unfortunately we're not testing for all of these other infections. That's part of what our group at HHS, that's part of what um, we've been looking at. Then there's maternal fetal transmission and solid organ transmission. So for example, if you were a transplant candidate and you had Babesia, you can transplant Babesia by taking your organ and giving it to someone else. Maternal transmission, same problem. It can be problematic for Babesia. In fact, we had a woman, two consecutive pregnancies, I'm gonna write up this case history hopefully by the end of the year. Um, Phyllis, get ready. Um, get the research going. Um, two consecutive pregnancies in her third trimester, she developed drenching sweats, she flew up to see me, Babesia fish from Igenix, fluorescent in C2 hybridization, RNA test positive, treated her with clindamycin, mepron, and zithromax, cleared the Babesia because if you give birth to a baby with Babesia and it's not treated, the baby can die from hemolytic anemia, where those red cells are just kind of bursting apart. So this is really important, again, for OBGYNs. Bartonella is transmitted. Lyme is transmitted. Babesia is transmitted. There could be problems with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So again, the OBGYNs are really not, I'm sure they've not been trained in this, and this is why education and prevention is so important when we're talking about all these different tick-borne diseases. Um, and then as we talked about, there's an increasing number of species of Borrelia and co-infections in the ticks. So this just came out, I'm gonna give you today, um, I tried to get some of the most recent medical literature that's come out within the last year, right? So I'm not boring you with the same lectures year after year when you come to hear me. Three populations of Babesia microti and one specific lineage that is now spread. Um, so this is done by Sam Telford. Sam Telford was one of the members who was on our HHS committee. Um, brilliant researcher who's been doing um, tick-borne research now for over 30, I think almost 40 years now at Tufts University. And when I was speaking to Sam, and this was great to have him on the committee because I was having open conversations for the first time, right, with these wonderful researchers from the CDC, the NIH, and Tops, and I said, Sam, I'm seeing so much persistent Babesia. I give people Mepron and Zithromax, the symptoms might get better, I stop the drugs, it comes back. I try Malarum, I try Coarctum, I try Larium, I try Dapsone, and I'll talk to you about these later. It's a really difficult parasite to and he let me know that there was a study published last year, and we're generally pretty good, Phyllis and I, combing the literature to get all the newest things. It turned out there was an article published late last year that there are genetic variants now that are causing resistance from Mepron and Zithromax. So it's like what I've been seeing now for a long time is finally being validated in the scientific literature. So just know that if you do have Babesia, okay, especially one of these lineages of microti that's spreading, um, that, that may be, you may need to start rotating drugs that I'll tell you about later. The other problem is, is that there are other Babesia species like Babesia duncani, WA1. Now, according to the CDC and, what's, and Sam's research, there's only 13 well-validated clinical specimens for Babesia duncani across the entire United States. My problem is that LabCorp, Quest, Bioreference, Igenix, they're all getting me back Babesia duncani. So if someone comes in with drenching sweats and chills and fevers and I'm suspecting Babesia, don't just check for Babesia microti. Check for Babesia duncani because the serology, they don't overlap and sometimes the fish test from Igenix, we will pick it up on that test or by PCR when we can't pick it up normally by titers. Then there were 33 viruses 
In ticks in New York that were just discovered, 24 are novel species. Wow. Now, I'm going to talk to you in just a little bit about the Powassan problem. But just know that this could be, and I don't think this is the major reason, but when we're talking about PTLDS, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, some people call it chronic Lyme disease. Some people call it Lyme MSIDS, because I've discovered 16 reasons why people stay sick. But it's possible that in even some of the patients I'm treating, and some of these new protocols that I'll tell you about at the end of the talk, using dapsone, pyrazinamide, these persister drugs with biofilm busters, which were having great success, it's possible that there are viruses that have been transmitted that we just didn't know existed that are causing some chronic problems. And when we try the classical antiviral drugs like Famvir and Valtrex, or even sometimes Valcite, which is a stronger drug for viruses, we sometimes get a little bit of help, but not a lot. So we need a lot more research in this area because the viruses may be playing a role in some of these people with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome who do not get better. And then, as I said, we have the diagnostic problem that you all know about. And the reason this is so important is because when you look at chronic fatigue syndrome, you look at fibromyalgia, and you look at autoimmune disease, I can't tell you the number of people who've come in with rheumatoid arthritis, or what they thought was rheumatoid arthritis, and it was Lyme imitating rheumatoid arthritis. It's studied in Europe. They saw Borrelia species causing rheumatoid factors being produced in animals. We see it in humans all the time. The key is you need a marker in the blood called CCP, cyclic citrullated peptide. That is the specific marker for true rheumatoid arthritis. So here's the question for you. Can a patient with true rheumatoid arthritis get bitten by a tick, yes or no? <laughs> Great, great. Because some of the rheumatologists don't seem to know that you're allowed to have more than one thing wrong with you. So for those of you who have not read the story in my second book, Brad had Lyme disease, co-infections, and Bagel's disease. Okay, let me, let me, do you know what Bagel's disease is? No, you're not aware. I'll, let me tell you. It's a, it's a very unusual disease. So Brad is a young man in his late 30s, and he comes into me, and he has true rheumatoid arthritis. His markers are there. He's got big, swollen knees from rheumatoid arthritis. He's been on every rheumatoid drug you can think of, prednisone, methotrexate, Enbrel, Arava. They've given it to him. It's not working. Brad fills out the HMQ, the questionnaire. His first question, do you have day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing? Yes, doc, I have drenching sweats. Yeah. Menopause or no? no? No, thank you. He has Babesia. Brad, do you have migratory joint pain that's moving around your body? Yes, he has Lyme disease. Third nail in the foot, right? This is the MSITS map. When does his knee pain really swell up? Every Sunday, Brad eats bagels, lox, and cream cheese. And his knee swells up to three times the size. Brad happened to be gluten sensitive and was not staying off. When we treated his Lyme, we treated his Babesia, and we got him off gluten, guess what? All of his symptoms got better. And then the rheumatoid drugs that didn't work, like methotrexate, worked perfectly because he was going to need to have a synovectomy from his knee and go for surgery because it was that bad. Okay, so you always have to remember differential diagnosis that there could be multiple overlapping sources of inflammation when these people get sick and the fact that these are all persisters. So when I tell you about the co-infections in Lyme today, just know persisters are Babesia, Bartonella, mycoplasma, different Borrelia species, including the Sensulatu, including relapsing fever. These have all been published in the medical literature to persist after standard courses of antibiotics. So remember that you've got to find ways of combining your regimens to go after not just Lyme, the cell wall forms, the cystic forms, sometimes called cell wall deficient forms, S forms, L forms, round bodies, right? There's many names for them the intracellular forms inside the cells, and the biofilm forms where the persisters may be that are dormant. So you have to think four forms with biofilms and co-infections, and that many of these organisms that are there may persist if you stop the treatment too early or you're not hitting the right co-infections. This one also just came out, disease severity of flaviviruses. So what are our flaviviruses? West Nile, Zika, Poasum, okay? These are our flaviviruses. 
So it turned out, I was telling you earlier about the microbiome, that it's very important, the type of bacteria. It turned out that if you give some antibiotics like neomycin, it may help, but some may make it worse. So the reason the flavoviruses, by the way, are important, and there's some big gaps here about flavoviruses. Did most of you know, by the way, that West Nile and Zika virus can persist in the body? A lot of my Lyme patients test positive for West Nile. So the question just is, when I see a West Nile virus that's positive, are they dealing with a low-level uh, viral infection in their brain? And what we don't know about Powassan, and I'm going to show you some astounding figures. Anyone here, let's see if you follow the literature, anyone here know how many, what the percentages of people in New York State who have Lyme disease are now testing positive for Powassan? You want to throw out a number? Yeah, you're, you're right, 15 is not that far off. The numbers are ranging between 9.4% and 17%. So how, how long does it take for Powassan to get into the body? 15 minutes of a tick bite. How about some rickettsial infections? 10 minutes. How about Borrelia hermsii relapsing fever? Five minutes. Do we need tick prevention? None of you should be going outside without permethrin-treated clothing, without IR3535 or picaritin on your skin, okay? With regular tick checks, you come inside, check your body, throw your clothes in the heat, on dry heat, in the dryer for 15 minutes at high heat, it'll kill the ticks, okay? And then we'll talk a little bit later about some tick prevention and Jill Auerbach's in the audience and she can tell you a little bit about um, Nucatone and some of the other things that are out there for trying to help your property um, with this. So prevention is absolutely essential. Okay? This is not an option in this day and age, also because there are mosquito-borne infections that are also happening. That's part of what the CDC was highlighting. So please, permethrin. I personally don't use a lot of DEET, although I think if you're in the deep woods, if you have to use at least a 20% DEET, it's fine. There were some cases of seizures in children, which is why we don't use it regularly. But a combination of permethrin on your clothes, and IR3535, by the way, was studied in Europe. It's an amino acid-based compound. It sounds kind of fancy, like, oh my God, what is this? It's okay even for pregnancy. It's safe. It's an amino acid-based compound. So that's on the skin, like picaritin. And then even eucalyptus oil has shown some efficacy. But please, do not go outside whether it's your lawns, your gardening outside, we all want to enjoy the great outdoors. I was driving here from the, you know, our Hudson Valley, which is beautiful, and my GPS took me on a way that I've not come. Gorgeous. I mean, we, we were looking at the campgrounds just driving over in all of the river. It's beautiful. We all love to enjoy our country this way, but you've got to do it and just be careful. So, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the MSITS model and the patients I've seen. The main thing I'm really sharing with you today is that the MSITS model is based on the fact that it's overlapping multiple causes of inflammation that are keeping people sick with downstream effects of that inflammation. So we learned in medical school something called Pastor's Postulate. There's one cause for one disease. That is not the case, for the, at least for the patients I've been seeing with Lyme disease. In my particular case, it is up to 16 reasons, and we'll go through this in a way that's very easy to understand. But what it comes down to is the three eyes. Infections, Lyme, maybe relapsing fever, which by the way, under the biofilms, the relapsing fever Borrelia and Borrelia have Borrelia sex under the biofilms and they exchange their DNA. There's genetic transfer of these Borrelia under the biofilm. So if you wonder how Lyme evades the immune system, and there's many different ways it does so, Garth Ehrlich has done some amazing work on this on genetic horizontal gene transfer that takes place under these biofilms. So we've got infections, Babesia, Bartonella on the top, right, with mycoplasma and Lyme, inflammation coming from multiple sources, microbiome, eating the wrong foods, not getting to sleep, environmental toxins, immune dysfunction that's coming from toxins and Borrelia, driving autoimmunity and, and immune dysfunction. So that's really what we're gonna be talking about. So infections and toxins are increasing autoimmune manifestations. So if you get a positive anti-nuclear antibody, that doesn't mean you have lupus, right? There's a marker for lupus, which is very specific, called the double-stranded DNA, or Smith antibody or antigen, right? And I'll show you why this is important, because of the seven differential diagnoses of migratory pain, lupus is one of them. 
So you have to be careful with autoimmunity because you'll get anti-nuclear antibodies, you'll get rheumatoid factors, you'll get antibodies against the nerves, anti-myelin antibodies like you'll see in MS, anti-gangliocyte antibodies, right? So you're gonna wanna look for these in people that have neuropathy, that tingling, numbness, numbness and burning sensations that are there. Um, but this inflammation is causing downstream effects. So for example, it affects your HPA, your hypothalamic pituitary axis, meaning it'll shut down the hormone production in some people. I have men in their 20s coming in with low testosterone, like they're 80 years old. I have women coming in in early menopause. And in fact, we just had a great success because, and this is another case, Phyllis, by the way, that we need to write up in the literature, we might man this one. No hormones, and I mean none, zero. No adrenal, like she had Addison's. No female hormones, no male sex hormones, no thyroid hormones. The Lyme disease completely shut down her pituitary and it took me six endocrinologists and myself to finally get her pituitary to work and she finally got pregnant and had a healthy baby and just gave birth um, to a child after all of this. By the way, I have a joke in my practice because there's about 100 women that um, have given you know, birth and I say, by the way, you, you gotta name him Richard if it's a boy. And, uh, so actually, she, they're, they're now putting middle names like, his name is James Richard, but it's like, okay, that'll, that'll kind of do. Um, so we've got the pituitary dysfunction, mitochondria, your mitochondria, which make the energy in your body, there's nothing protecting them. Your DNA around have histones, okay? They have something protecting them from free radical oxidative stress damage. Your mitochondria don't have that. So what is that gonna cause? Fatigue, heart dysfunction, nerve dysfunction. Then you have problems with the autonomic nervous system, right? You stand up, you get dizzy, you get palpitations. You have presyncope, you feel like you're gonna pass out, or you do pass out, right? Those are symptoms of POTS dysautonomia. And in that case, it's not just a question of giving more antibiotics. It's a question of bringing up the blood pressure, okay? So you have to know differential diagnosis because POTS causes fatigue, it causes brain fog, it causes palpitations, it causes anxiety. Well, those are the same symptoms you see with Lyme, but you don't treat it with antibiotics. So POTS dysautonomia is probably about 40% of our practice, um, and we have a paper that was accepted to one of the medical journals, uh, which we're looking at the 16-point model. It should be out maybe August or September of this year. It was already accepted um, for pre-publication. So we have to look at all of these different downstream effects, and we have to block the production of these inflammatory molecules. Now, there are several biochemical pathways, and they sound kind of fancy, but they're really easy. One is called NF-kappa B. What this is, is it's a switch inside your nucleus. And if you have this free radical oxidative stress, inflammation in your body, there are these molecules inside your cells in the cytoplasm, right? They're called NRF2. And NRF2 is bound to these molecules that when you have oxidative stress, goes into your nucleus and it stimulates genes called antioxidant response element genes and it opens up your detox pathways and it shuts down inflammation. But we have to figure a way, out a way to stop the switch inside the nucleus called NF-kappa B from turning on. Because this is one of those switches that you're producing these inflammatory molecules that's giving you the symptoms of Lyme and these associated co-infections. It's the same problem with the nitric oxide pathway. So you need some nitric oxide for your heart. It was molecule of the year, something like 20 years ago, right? You get angina, you get chest pain, you pop a nitroglycerin under your tongue opens up the nitric oxide, but too much will create actually oxidative stress and can create the same inflammatory molecules that we see with Lyme. So we have to block the production, we have to lower the inflammation, and then we have to open up the detox pathways to get people better. But the key here is you have to treat all the overlapping sources of inflammation. Now you'll notice I'm repeating this multiple times because it's important that these are the take home messages. Yes, it's Lyme, it's Babesia, it's Bartonella and Mycoplasma, but it's toxins, it's food allergies, it's leaky gut, it's the wrong bacteria in your gut. Zinc deficiency will cause the same inflammatory cytokine production that we're talking about with foods and with Lyme. And if you don't fall asleep, you get high interleukin-6 levels, inflammation that just keeps going on. And Lyme patients don't sleep, right? Most of you here probably know that. There's a problem with Lyme, it's called DSPS, delayed sleep phase syndrome. It's a circadian rhythm disorder. It means you can't fall asleep or you keep waking up in the middle of the night. There's only one other group 
of patients who this happens to apart from Lyme disease. Do you know who that is? No, it's actually teenagers. <laughs> if it's men over 50, we have to talk, actually. It's, um, although my father used to get up a lot in the middle of the night and have a cup of coffee and Entenmann's cake. I'm not sure what that was about. Um, so in any case, you've got to go after somebody else who likes coffee and Entenmann's cake in the middle of the night. Thank you, sir. Um, so the MSITS model that I'm telling you about is a personalized precision model, right? This is where medicine is looking to go. Guidelines are giving you general ideas of how to treat patients. But for those of us who do complex chronic disease medicine, where the patients who come to see me have seen 10 to 20 doctors and they don't know how to help them, you have to have a logical way of going through these complex patients, and that's where this MSITS model helps to personalize the treatment to find out what infections do you have? What co-infections do you have? Do you have mold? Do you have heavy metals? Do you have mineral deficiencies? Do you have autoimmune problems? Do you have immune deficiency? Which actually quite a few of the Lyme patients do. So one size does not fit all. This is a paradigm shift for how we treat, but the 16 point model goes through it in a very logical manner. So here's the paper that we finally published and Phyllis and I celebrated. I can't remember where we went out to dinner because three years working on this paper before we finally got this into the journals. And I will tell you, it, it was a very complex study. If you read it and you looked at statistics, um, the paper has been downloaded. I think Phyllis said it's something like 14,000 people have downloaded this paper at this point. It's, it's one of the most highly read papers. And it would make sense because it's the first validated symptom questionnaire for Lyme disease. Which means that physicians and patients, you could use this questionnaire um, to give you an idea what is the probability that you may be suffering from a tick-borne infection. So we did this in 1,600 patients from three different medical practices, um, also email and social media through an online survey. And the questionnaire had several sections. So section one is a symptom checklist. This is 38 symptoms from none to frequent. And this was based, by the way, on Dr. Boroscano's questionnaire years ago. The only thing different that I did was to either put, we have two versions, severity, mild, moderate, severe, 1 point, 2 point, 3 points, or you have none, zero, or extremely frequent, three. So we started scoring each of the symptoms to add them up. The second one is the Lyme incidence scale. Do you live in a Lyme endemic area? Have you had tick bites? Have you had a bullseye rash? And have you ever had migratory symptoms? Now, we were at Ronstram Center probably six months ago doing blood draws for TGen, uh, which is a lab in Arizona, which is trying to do some RNA analysis to see if we can get better testing. And we were there and we were looking at the questionnaires. And we went through about 300 questionnaires and I think about half of them, 150 people, we were looking at them, scored 80, 90, or 100. Over 63 on this questionnaire means you have a high probability most of the people, these 50%, had two or three migratory symptoms, and many of them answered on question one and 22, fever, sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, can't catch my breath, looks like Babesia. We were able to diagnose just looking at the questionnaire. And it was very interesting because now they're starting to look at the questionnaire and scores with the TGen results, and hopefully that will be a paper that will be coming out soon. The Healthy Day Scale, this was based on a CDC questionnaire of how many healthy days, both mental and physical, do you have during the month? And the last one is a common Lyme score. So for example, in early studies done by Shattuck, which was published in the literature, if you had a constellation of symptoms like fatigue, flu-like symptoms, headache, tingling, neuropathy, sleep disorders, memory problems, that would give you a higher score. So a score more than 63 gives you a high probability of Lyme disease but it's especially if migratory is present. So this is very easy because migratory pain, as I'll show you in a second, does not show up in many different diseases. Now here's a question. So we went through the literature in great detail. We only found seven different diseases in medicine. Now acute rheumatic fever, there are still cases in the United States. It can cause carditis. It actually can cause some rashes, but it's after a strep infection. You should have high ASO titers, um, right, to, to be able to diagnose it. Crohn's disease, well, inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, you should be able to tell if somebody has diarrhea with blood and fevers, right? Different than Lyme. Gonococcal arthritis, 
you're probably not going to miss that diagnosis. Hepatitis, easy to diagnose, just check the liver functions. Easy to check, hepatitis B and C. Reactive arthritis, well, I haven't really seen too many cases over the years, um, but you could get a salmonella or Yersinia infection and get very swollen joints, okay? But that's not usually what we see with Lyme. Lupus is probably the one, I would say, that's the closest, biggest imitator to Lyme that you have to be careful. Because lupus will cause a lot of itis, inflammation. Carditis, pericarditis, pleuritis, right, encephalitis. It causes a lot of inflammatory disease like Lyme, and it's probably the most difficult one to differentiate. That's why those specific markers for lupus, double-stranded DNA, Smith antigens and antibodies are very important, right? When you look at the American Rheumatological Association criteria for lupus, you need four out of 11 criteria. But again, if you have Borrelia-specific bands with migratory pain, Lyme is the only one that's going to have the migratory pain here regarding nerve pain. So, and remember again, you still could have a patient with lupus who gets a tick bite. So again, remember, this is not just usually one disease we're talking about. So the factors that show up most often on this questionnaire was neuropathy, tingling, numbness, burning, cognitive dysfunction, memory problems, concentration problems. I walk in a room, I can't remember why. I have word finding problems. I'm reversing letters and numbers. Musculoskeletal pain, generally migratory around the body. Fatigue, I have good days, I have bad days. Women are usually worse right before, during, or after their period. Dysautonomia, low blood pressure, right? Where I stand up, I can't hold the blood pressure, I get dizzy with palpitations, and I have cardiorespiratory symptoms with chest pain, which by the way, is usually in about 70% of the Lyme patients, is costochondritis. It's inflammation in the chest wall. A lot of my patients go to the cardiologist worried they're gonna die of a heart attack because they have chest pain. Most of the time, it's due to costochondritis. It doesn't mean that Lyme and Bartonella and co-infections can't cause an endocarditis, an infection of your heart valve, right, or a myocarditis or a pericarditis, it can. But most of the time what you're dealing is, um, you're dealing with Lyme with inflammation in the chest wall. So five factors consistent on the questionnaire with Lyme, fatigue, flu-like symptoms, joint stiffness, tingling, concentration problems, migratory pain, very significant. It had convergent and divergent construct validity as well as predictive validity, and discriminant analysis said we could accurately classify your Lyme status with an 87% accuracy. Now the reason the 87% accuracy is important is because if you look at the two-tier testing, it's about a coin flip of using ELISA followed by a Western blot, right? It's actually 56%, 57% in some of the studies. Our questionnaire, the HMQ, was able to pick it up 87% of the time just by taking a clinical history, right? And the father of medicine years ago described this again, take a history. 90% of the time, that's how you're gonna make the diagnosis. So again, 63 or higher, high probability, 45 to 62 probable, 25 to 44 possible. And we do have people, by the way, with a score of 40 or in the high 30s who still have it, right? So again, just remember, this, these are guidelines, but it at least gives you a certain probability. And here's the discriminant analysis again, 87.6%. So the question then is you've done the questionnaire and then you have to ask yourself, well, do I test or not test? We published this article, this was a letter to the editor in Clinical Mi Microbiology and Infection. And what we talked about in here is that the two-tier testing is not reliable. We have all these other Borrelia species like Sensulato that are spreading worldwide. And again, Borrelia miyamotoi relapsing fever is spreading and you can pick it up by the two-tier testing. So you really have to know how to pull a clinical history, right, to figure it out. So the first most important point is Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. Right? You don't make it based on a blood test. If you have an erythema migrans rash, right, and rashes only show up in approximately 50% of the people, and 25% of the time, it looks like a bullseye. Right? The other half the time, it might look like a spreading solid rash, which a lot of dogs sometimes confuse with a spider bite or an infection of the skin like cellulitis. Right? So you have to be careful. Solid spreading rashes can also be um, erythema migrans rashes. If you test too early, you're not gonna get a positive test. If you give people antibiotics too early, you're gonna shut down having a positive antibody response. So the two-tiered protocol is gonna miss about half the people. We have found if we have a negative ELISA, 
that sometimes doing the C6 ELISA, right, will pick it up. Why is that? Well, that's because we talked about these different Borrelia species, and the C6 also contains Avzeli and Gurini, which are the European strains. And I asked Sam Telford just a couple of days ago, you know, birds across the U.S. border in Canada, they're finding Borrelia gurinii in the ticks, some of these species from Europe. And there's, for those of you who also follow the news a little bit, there was a tick, Haemophilus longicornis, which is called the bush tick, that showed up in New Jersey. Now this tick is an East Asian tick. It showed up on sheep in New Jersey. And it just showed up now that it, it survived the winter. So now it's showing up in New Jersey. Why am I bringing this up for you? This tick knows how to reproduce without having a mate. It actually reproduces on its own. And the Lone Star tick is the main tick that transmits the alpha-gal allergy, that you get the meat allergy where you get a tick bite or several tick bites, and all of a sudden you eat meat, and minutes to hours later you have an anaphylactic reaction where your throat is closing off, you get a swollen tongue, and it can be fatal. Now most of the time that's from the Lone Star Tick, Amboloma americanum. However, this bush tick, Haemophilus longicornis, has been associated in other parts of the world with alpha-gal allergy. So I'm bringing this up because we normally wouldn't think about alpha-gal normally in this part of the northeastern United States, but with new ticks starting to appear, we have to be very, very careful. <coughs> so the BAMs on the Western Bloc, we talked about the importance. If you don't get antibodies, which are indirect tests, you may want to try and get direct tests. DNA, PCR, polymerase chain reaction. RNA, fish testing. Culture, you're an antigen testing, right? Lymphocyte transformation test. The key point here is it's a test panel, right? It's not one test that's necessarily going to pick it up. So 10 to 20% of the ticks that we're now finding are Miyamotoi, right? the agent of relapsing fever, not gonna pick it up on standard testing. They found that 4% of the people in New England had it, didn't even know that they had it. And now we see it's becoming as frequent, as I said, as anaplasma, babesia, right? And Lyme is Borrelia miyamotoi. So docs out there and patients, remember, Lyme-like syndromes, relapsing fever Borrelia, you're not gonna pick it up on the standard testing, right? And then Babesia bartonella, same problems with the testing. We'll talk about this in a second. So all of these tick-borne infections, you need to know that they're finding, and there was a paper published several years ago in France, that co-infections are the rule, not the exception. Okay? In French, that would be, les co-infections, c'est les règles, c'est pas l'exception. <laughs> <laughs> so Borrelia, Neorickettsia, Ehrlichia, parasites, Bartonella, mycoplasma, you can get several of these tick-borne infections with one tick bite. So the reason these are important is, for example, anaplasma can cause immune deficiency, right? It affects the way your immune system functions. It can cause fatalities in up to 1% of the cases. Or leukiosis can cause fatalities in up to 3% of the cases, especially in children, right? Babesiosis can cause fatalities in the very young or the very elderly. So these people who are at risk of these infections are especially the very young and elderly or anyone who is immunosuppressed. And I'll make a case, actually, that immunosuppression and immune dysfunction is happening, actually, with a lot of these tick-borne infections. And we discussed that in the paper that we just published last night. Bartonella, there's multiple species. So if you have over 36 different species of Bartonella, and 17 of which are at least pathogenic, are you going to pick up Bartonella by just checking for Bartonella hensile? No. How about Quintana, trench fever? No. How about Bacilliformis? No. That's why Ron was telling you about Galaxy Laboratories. Or that's why I use the Bartonella fish test for my genetics, because sometimes I can't pick it up in the standard labs. The antibodies don't go broad enough to cover all the species. And this is the problem we have with most of these, right? Rocky Mountain spotted fever, 10 to 15% of the fatalities are in young children less than 10 years old, because again, the pediatricians are afraid to give doxycycline to kids less than eight years old because it's gonna stain their teeth. The CDC came out and changed the guidelines years ago. This is really important. This is a take-home message for you. Doxycycline is the number one thing you give to children, to adults of all ages, and even in pregnancy. It is safe in short courses. Rifampin can be used as a second line for rickettsial. It shows some efficacy, but it's never been tested to have the same efficacy in pregnancy. Okay, But it is in the literature for it. 
Tularemia, we see cases of tularemia, okay? In the Cape Cod area, 10% of the nationally reported cases are in Cape Cod, and it's not from a tick bite. It's actually from aerosolized tularemia that's getting from the sea foam and everything that's getting into people. It's from inhaled tularemia. So these things are getting transmitted through multiple fashions. And I learned, by the way, this is again Sam Telford who educated me tremendously on many of these things. Typhus, Q fever, we do pick up Coxiella burnetti. This is not exceptional. If you are sick and you've not found the answer, apart from looking at environmental toxins, apart from looking at immune dysfunction, apart from getting you to sleep and detoxing, these co-infections are on the top of the list of what's keeping people sick in my practice. This is a study that just came out several months ago. Ixodes ticks contain Lyme and Powassan virus. Okay, it is spreading. You can see when you look at the prior um, map and what is now happening, it is spreading rapidly. And they're finding a lot in Michigan and in parts of the central United States, and they're finding it also on the East Coast. This just came out just recently from last year, and there's new studies by Tom et al. in 2018. 53 patients with Lyme disease, 70% tested positive for Powassan. So there was a study that was just published early this year by Connie Knox and her group from um, Cope Laboratories that in Lyme endemic areas, when people tested positive for Lyme disease, if they tested them for Powassan, the area in this area of New York, it was 9.4%. So you have to understand that many of these people just got a flu-like illness and thought they had like a virus. Thank God they didn't get the, the bad neurological complications. But if you get neuroinvasive disease, 50% of those people have long-term complications. Severe memory problems, seizures, all kinds of problems, and 10 to 15% are fatal. Okay, we had four fatalities in Dutchess County and Columbia County just past year from Powassan virus. So this is spreading, you may think this is rare, but it's starting to show up in a lot of Lyme patients. This is again why I'm saying to you about prevention. This gets in within 15 minutes of a tick bite. I mentioned 4% of people in southern New England ended up having Borrelia miyamotoi, relapsing fever, along with Lyme. They didn't even know it because we weren't testing for it years ago. So there's been over 16 new species of Borrelia that have been happening um, in the last um, six, what is it? less 20 years, actually 30 years. Now, not all of these are pathogenic, okay? But the ones you're seeing here is Sensolatu, Sensu Strictu, um, Mayoni, which was discovered through the Mayo Clinic, right, which actually has a rash, um, Borrelia californicus, which they're discovering in California. I had an MS patient with multiple sclerosis, by the way, that I kept telling the UCLA doctors it was Lyme causing an, an MS presentation, but Western blot didn't show. All of a sudden, when Igenix added on with your immunoblot, this particular strain from California, guess what? Her Lyme Western blot lit up because we got the right strain of Borrelia. There are countries in Europe where they've done this. They've actually taken the Borrelia strains from their country and they've made country-specific Western blots. That makes complete sense because then you're going to have a higher possibility of being able to pick this up. So you'll see all of these different species. And again, I was telling you about Borrelia lanei. The other one is Borrelia bassetti. Borrelia bassetti also is pathogenic. It's sensulatu. It does cause human disease. Again, not picked up on the standard testing. So the problems with diagnostic testing is we really are hiding the line. And of course, many people are confused because of the two guidelines, right? The IDSA guidelines, Ron was saying, easy to diagnose, easy to cure. ILADS guidelines, the opposite not easy to find, although I would actually argue it's not that it's difficult to diagnose. I've been doing it for 34 years. You just have to know how to take a proper clinical history and do a differential diagnosis. But the point being, these guidelines are confusing for people. So, you know, the question is, well, what is really the problem? Well, I think most of you know what the problem is. And we get false positive, right? You can get false positive tests, but you also get false negative tests. So a study that just came out, but one of my prior co-authors in, in Europe, um, Alex Lacoud, very interesting, just published in Medical Hypothesis, we sometimes can't find the antibodies because the bugs are hiding under the biofilms. What would happen if you used biofilm busters to open up the biofilms and then see if you could get PCR antibody evidence? It's very interesting. It's a study that does need to be done. 
So this is the panel of tests. So this is the approach I recommend. You need to do a panel approach if you want to prove it. If your ELISA is negative, do a C6 ELISA. If your ELISA and your C6 are negative, think of doing an immunofluorescent assay, an IFA. Do a Western blot, IgM and IgG. And for those docs out there or patients who don't know this, you will more frequently see IgM Western blots in chronic persistent Lyme. It's not just early Lyme disease. There was an article published by Kraft and Steer going back to 1988 where this was described. We describe it again in the article we just published last night on immune deficiency. It is well known that when Borrelia invades the lymph nodes, this was published by California researchers, it hits the parts of the lymph node where you make IgG antibodies, which are your good antibodies for killing the Lyme, and it leaves the outside part of the lymph nodes that make IgM. And that may explain why we're seeing many more IgM than IgG antibodies in many of our patients with persistent Lyme. But apart from direct test, indirect, you want to do direct testing. PCR, Lyme.blot, Lyme.antigen, culture, nanotrap. Right? So some of these we can do in New York and some of we can. We really need this test. This was developed by John Hopkins researchers. Um, they're looking at chemokines. The problem we have is Joseph Ohlone, who in Poughkeepsie, New York, died of Lyme carditis. He went to his doctor with a sore throat and some fevers and diarrhea and a cough, and his doctor said it's a virus. And he goes back several days later, and they say, all right, let's test you for Lyme. Let's do it, ELISA. The ELISA's negative. And he dies three weeks later. He was one of the Lyme carditis cases. Well, if this test, through John Hopkins University, using chemokines, CXCL9, CXCL10, CCL19, with, by the way, John Alcott, who's the chair of our committee for HHS, he's published on this as a marker that we're seeing in persistent Lyme. So we've been looking for these biomarkers for a long time. These are markers that are produced before antibodies are produced. So they're looking at the Spira test at Columbia University to see if we can get this out in a commercial form. Very important test that they get this one out eventually. What's new in testing? And by the way, there's a lot of new tests that have just come down the pike. There's next generation enzyme immunoassays. So these are multiplex assays with a combination of these enzyme immunoassays. So they're looking at what they're calling a two EIA testing protocol, a whole cell sonicate EIA and a C6 EIA in a two-tier testing. They're looking to replace the ELISA followed by a Western blot. This is published by Steve Schutzer. They're looking to possibly look at this different type of a protocol with a whole cell sonicate EIA and a C6 EIA. Still needs to be published and looked at. A single multiplex test which evaluates antibody responses to multiple Borrelia antigens. So these would be microchips looking at all these different Borrelia species that are out there. Then they're looking at what are called nested PCRs. So we need to detect all these new species of bacteria causing tick-borne Borreliosis, right? So nested PCRs are generated um, and it decreases inhibitors. Part of the problem with doing PCR studies is there's inhibitors in the serum. Nested PCRs helps to get the inhibitors out of the serum so you can pick up um, the DNA, and there's real-time PCR seeing if it's active in the body with nested PCR. And Dr. Sin Hali did a study with the New York State Health Department and showed that they were equivalent and that his test was reliable. Then they're looking at broad PCR screening, um, followed by what's called multi-locus sequence typing and next-generation sequencing. The point being, there are all these new tests just in the last year that are all now starting to be looked at so we can get better diagnostics for the physicians and for the patients to be able to pick this up. And then again, real-time PCR is not just for Lyme, but for anaplasma, phagocytophilum, for Babesia. So again, if you have an acute infection before antibodies are produced, you may be able to pick up the DNA of the organism early on. And this just got released by Tokars February just a couple of months ago uh, through again Columbia that they're looking at a zero chip where you put a drop of your blood on there, and you're not just going to check for Lyme, it's going to do a whole panel of tests for anaplasma, Babesia microti, Lyme disease, Borrelia miyamotoi, relapsing fever, Ehrlichia, Rickettsia rickettsia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Heartland, and Powassan virus. By the way, this needs to be the standard. No sh nobody should be just testing for Lyme. Co-infections are the rule. 
So even if the tick-point disease serochip is not yet available commercially, this is still the kind of testing that we need to be doing on patients who are ill. And then they're looking at some newer testing. Hygenix just released the Lyme immunoblot, where they started adding some of the other major antigens against the Sentulatu species, so not just B31, but 297, which they've always had on their Western blots. That's, by the way, why I've always had better results with their Western blots, is because adding that 297 strain, when I get their Western blots back, the Borrelia bands light up more than I'll get it necessarily from Quest or LabCorp. But they also included the California species, Myoni, Avzeli, and Garini from Europe. Again, the point is, it's not just Lyme, it's these other Borrelia species. We need to go broad because we really should be calling it Borreliosis, right? That's really what we're, we're talking about. And then, of course, expand Babesia testing, not just for Microti, but for Wa1 Duncani, not just antibodies, but DNA and fish testing, RNA, because we pick up a lot of RNA when the antibodies are negative, and you can expand the net for all of these other tick-borne infections while screening for the 16 points on the MSIDS map. So what you're looking at here on the left-hand side, this is the sources of inflammation. Multiple infections, immune dysfunction with inflammation, heavy metals and mold, toxins, allergies, sensitivities, nutritional and enzyme deficiencies. On the right-hand side, what happens, the downstream effects, we get neurological dysfunction, endocrine problems where it shuts off the hormones, you can't fall asleep, the part of your nervous system that controls your blood pressure, autonomic nervous system, is it working properly? You get GI disorders, elevated liver functions, and pain symptoms. So if we, as a clinician and patients, if you simplify this, and you think about, all right, well, here's the primary sources of inflammation that cause the symptoms I'm having with Lyme and tick-borne disorders, but I also have to treat the downstream effects, right? So this is a very easy way to kind of understand, get to all the sources of inflammation, right? Dysbiosis, eating the wrong foods, seeing if you have leaky gut with allergies, detoxing the heavy metals and mold out of your body, getting to sleep, seeing if you have mineral deficiencies, magnesium, copper, iodine, zinc. We find those in 25% of our patients just coming right in for their first visits but then you've got to treat those downstream effects. So what it comes down to is what I call the three eyes. So the common denominator on all of these 16 points on the MSIDS map is that we have these multiple sources of inflammation, infections and toxins, driving an inflammatory response, causing autoimmune reactions. They're turning on that switch inside the nucleus called NF-kappa B. You're now producing all these inflammatory molecules called cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis alpha, IL-17, and these are damaging the cells in your body. By the way, they've also found the same inflammatory cytokines in Alzheimer's disease. And there are small cells inside your brain called microglial cells. The glial cells are kind of the garbage collectors of your brain, right? They now know there are these things called glymphatics, that the reason you need to get a good night's sleep is because the glymphatics are helping to get the toxins and stuff out of your body while you're sleeping. And what the microglial cells are doing is they get activated by these toxins. Okay, it got published several years ago in JAMA. They found pesticides in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, and they know that if you put brain cells with pesticides in a culture dish, it forms amyloid plaque and tau proteins, just like you get it with different infections, right? And spirochetes have been found in Lyme patients. So, but it's not just the infections. We also find that some of these infectious agents cause neurotoxins. So up until now, I've been telling you about toxins from the environment. We are exposed to three to 500 environmental toxins every day. BPA, small particle pollution, plastics, pesticides, heavy metals, they all act as foreign-based estrogens in the body. That is in part, according to what I've seen in the literature, why you're seeing rises in rates of breast cancer uterine cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer. These are all related in part. Now, this is not genetics with BRCA genes and the rest, but it's one of the factors that I am seeing that's showing up in the literature for this. So you're also going to get autoimmunity. So we know Borrelia causes autoimmune reactions, but guess what? So do these toxins. This is now showing up in the medical literature over and over again 
And when you look at these different diseases that are causing chronic diseases in our country, Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis, fibromyalgia, environmental illness, which by the way is now being reported in up to 13% of Americans in this country, with 26% that have sensitivity to chemicals, just published several months ago in the medical literature. Autism spectrum disorder, Alzheimer's, autoimmune, they sound like they're different diseases, but what if the same factors, infections and toxins, and again there's genetics, like with Alzheimer's, APOE, but what if infections and toxins were contributing in part to this? Because we are seeing a rise of autoimmune reactions in the United States. There's over 50 million Americans who are being diagnosed with autoimmune diseases in this country. That means one out of every seven people is turning out to have some form of an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, okay, Hashimoto's. They're all showing up now in greater number. Why? Well, we know that infections and toxins drive autoimmune phenomena. So this Borrelia species in Europe that causes neurological Lyme symptoms, Borrelia carinae, it's been associated with elevated rheumatoid factors and cytokine production. But mercury, bisphenol A, drink hard plastic, not soft plastic. Asbestos, small particle pollution, all now being linked up right, to autoimmune disease. So when we look at overlapping causes of autoimmunity, yes, there are genetic factors. If you're a Lyme patient who is HLA-DR2 or DR4 positive, you're gonna have more severe reactions with this disease. Alan Steer has published on this um, extensively. But you could also have vitamin D deficiency that's contributing. What's interesting is, for those of you who don't know it, if you have a high 125 vitamin D ratio to a 25 vitamin D, so the vitamin D, when you get sunlight, vitamin D3 is produced in your skin, goes to your liver, forms 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and that goes to your kidney to form 125, which is your active vitamin D. Well, they've shown that if you have multiple intracellular infections, which is what I'm gonna to talk to you about at the end of this lecture, Lyme is intracellular, Bartonella is intracellular, Mycoplasma is intracellular, uh, Tularemia is intracellular. Okay, they're intracellular infections. If you get a high 125 to 25 ratio, it implies you may have active intracellular infections. Boy, that's kind of an interesting marker that we could use as clinicians and patients to look at this. But you might have microbiome imbalances, leaky gut, hormones, and pollutions. The CDC did a report back in 2003 and they found that there were a lot of toxins showing up in people. 116 different pollutants from the study that was done, this was a $6.5 million study showed up, 13 heavy metals, 14 combustion byproducts, 10 pesticides, one of these, trichloroethylene, that's the stuff, by the way, you smell when you go to the dry cleaners, that caused leukemia epidemic in young children in Woburn, Massachusetts. So we're getting a lot of toxins. And it's cut off at the bottom of the slide by 12.8% have chemical sensitivity, 26% have other forms of chemical exposure to. Why else detoxify? Miscarriages, fetal death, birth weight, fetal developmental effects. The IQ of children goes down with toxins and autism risk goes up. It ups your risk of coronary artery disease, of having heart attacks. And adults, it raises your risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It raises autoimmune disease risk, cancer risk, raises your risk of emphysema, obesity, and diabetes. And those small cells in the brain that I was telling you about with Alzheimer's, those microglial cells, they get activated by these environmental toxins as well as infections. So infections and toxins causes inflammation in neurological Lyme disease. Infections, toxins, and inflammation cause neurological symptoms in multiple sclerosis, where chlamydia pneumonia and Epstein-Barr virus variants have been linked up to MS, as well as mercury that causes demyelination. You'll see demyelination even with Bartonella in certain co-infections. And here's your low vitamin D associated with MS. That's interesting. Is it the 125 to 25, meaning it's intracellular chlamydia pneumonia or others driving the disease? Infections, toxins, and inflammation have been linked up to symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. This study was published uh, four years ago. Seven out of 20 patients with dementia had Lyme in their central nervous system, and basically these have been found under biofilms through Drexel University researchers in Pennsylvania. But not again just Lyme, right? 
CMV, cytomegalovirus, herpes virus 1, chlamydia pneumonia, helicobacter pylori, different viruses and bacteria are showing up causing the inflammatory response. And when we used to look at syphilis 100 years ago, did syphilis cause dementia? Of course it did. So this is not so surprising that Borrelia species and other infections could be related to this, but there it is in JAMA neurology, <coughs> pesticide levels associated with Alzheimer's, and even in the Framingham study 50 years ago, they knew that inflammation was associated with it. Infections, toxins, and inflammation causes neurological symptoms in ALS. Every ALS patient that I have seen in my practice has always been exposed to Lyme. That doesn't mean Lyme causes ALS, but it's certainly associated with the causes where I believe you might have genetic causes, like superoxide dismutase, and then now they published that pesticides and these different toxins are now being associated with ALS, but Lyme is also maybe causing more of that neurological inflammation. Autism spectrum disorder, infections and toxins are causing inflammation in autism. Children with autism spectrum disorder, some percentage who are treated with antibiotics, their autism symptoms get better. UC California Davis published four years ago, if you're exposed to pesticides, right, in the womb or Harvard, mercury, lead, manganese, methylene chloride, diesel exhaust, if you lived 150 feet from a highway and exposed to these toxins, your risk of autism was much higher. In Salt Lake City, where they have an inversion of pollution, the rate was one to 48. In parts of the southern United States, one to 250 based on the pollution and environmental inversion. Infections and toxins relates to autism spectrum disorder and, and neuropsychiatric symptoms. There are over a thousand suicides that have now been linked up to Lyme every year in the United States. Neurological symptoms with this type of neuroinflammation, there's over 40,000 suicides that are unexplained in this country every year. And Bob Bransfield has put out some very exquisite articles on the topic. For those of you who've not read his work, you should take a look at it. But it explains about, again, how many of these inf inf infections are driving this type of inflammatory response. So it's not surprising with what I just showed you that the prevalence of chronic disease is rising in the United States and they're suspecting that about 50% of Americans, and when Phyllis and I wrote a letter to Congress that we hand-delivered last year before we were trying to get this committee formed, and we talked about that almost 50% of Americans, right, had at least one chronic disorder by the time they were starting to hit 50 years old. So oxidative stress and inflammation is underlying most chronic disease. Whether you call it Alzheimer's, whether you call it strokes, whether you cause it heart attacks, asthma, we need to find a common denominator that explaining because 86% of our healthcare costs and 70% of the deaths in this country are due to chronic disease. We need a model. What are the common denominators? And that's what I'm trying to show you today. So this switch inside the nucleus, NF-kappa B, this is what's causing in part some of these inflammatory molecules to be produced. How do we shut it down? Well, we're going to use glutathione. Actually, you couldn't see it on the slide here alpha lipoic acid and antioxidants. We could use things to shut down the production of NF-kappa B. But as I said, the nitric oxide pathway is also involved. And it's not just from infections, like bacteria and viruses. Environmental toxins will cause the same inflammatory process on a biochemical level. So, you know, some doctors will use what are called DMAR drugs, Plaquenil, IVIG. But if you're looking at it from an integrative alternative medicine perspective, you also have to figure out how do we block NF-kappa B with antioxidants, with alpha lipoic acid, with glutathione, which has again been published in the medical literature. And then there's that molecule inside the cytoplasm I was telling you about that's very useful, that helps to shut down inflammation. It's called NRF2. If it goes into your nucleus and it hits those genes called ARE, antioxidant response element genes, it helps to shut down inflammation, opens up your detoxification pathways, and hits the P53 cancer gene to try and shut down cancer. Now there's four natural substances. Yours truly swallows them every day. This is part of the 52 supplements I swallow every morning because everyone in my family died of cancer. My mother, my father, and all six aunts and uncles. I have no one left in my family at this point. I take sulforaphane broccoli seed extract. 
It's also called um, glucosinosate. So broccoli seed extract um, or glucoraphanin, sulforaphane, the most powerful natural product you can take that goes to your liver, goes to your phase two enzymes and opens them up to start getting rid of toxins, lowering inflammation. I take 200 milligrams a day. In the John Hopkins study, when they gave it to autism, a spectrum disorder kids, they gave them 300 milligrams. Two thirds of the autism spectrum patients' brains woke up on broccoli seed extract. Published with John Hopkins, by the way. They have, they have the patent actually on this when it came out. Resveratrol, that's in red wine. I don't drink, I get headaches, I fall asleep. Which by the way, I wish I would have known when I went to medical school in Belgium. 500 Belgian beers? Come on, Rich, let's go out for a drink and the head's on the table while they're, it's like, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't. I'm hypoglycemic, I sweep my blood sugars, I got it. So I take, I take resveratrol. Resveratrol hits the sirtuin genes in your body for longevity. Never proven in humans yet, they've shown it in the animal model, but this is again one of those ARE gene activators. Green tea extract, right? EGCG and curcumin, turmeric, right? High doses of turmeric also, same thing with this pathway. So I take several grams of um, curcumin every day. I take 200 milligrams of this broccoli seed extract. I take resveratrol. I take green tea extracts. And by the way, if you're doing green tea naturally, please, it has to be organic. They have found DDT and high levels of pesticides in 70% of the teas on supermarket shelves. There are heavy metals and pesticides. Organic, please. How do we lower inflammation? Block that switch inside the nucleus. Block those cells in the brain that are turning on the inflammation. Do an anti-inflammatory diet. Who here thinks that the paleo diet is the best diet for lowering inflammation? Raise your hand. Who thinks the Mediterranean diet is the best one? Well, you both be right. So Mount Sinai actually published on this. It turns out they both work. They both work for lowering inflammation, both paleo and Mediterranean. Mediterranean style diets is really perfect for people with Lyme, autoimmune type diets. You know, lots of healthy fresh fruits and vegetables, not the high carb fruits, lots of berries, organic again, a um, little bit of fresh fish. You wanna be careful these days with what's in the oceans. Um, you maybe know the plasticizers and small particles of plastics are now showing up in the fish. It's, it's a mess what we've done to our planet. Um, and replace the fish with minerals. Heal the damage to the body, we were talking about that. Heal the damage to the mind and emotions. A lot of people come in with PTSD. They've been to 20 doctors and told that it's all in their head. I say it is all in your head. You got spirochetes in your head. You got toxins in your head. It's in your head. Balance the hormones, balance the cytokines, balance the, that microbiome of the gut. Lots of studies coming out on the microbiome related Prevotella species with rheumatoid arthritis, Clostridium species with multiple sclerosis. Huge amount of literature coming out on the bacteria in your gut and how it's affecting your health. One of those next frontiers of medicine. Treat the infections and detoxify. This kind of got cut off a little bit. So this is a slide on modified citrus pectin. So I'm gonna tell you in a little bit about biofilm busters, about things we didn't know six, seven years ago about how we treat Lyme. It turns out that when I wanna naturally detoxify now, there's actually a lot of studies on modified citrus pectin. Those microglial cells we were saying that get activated, it helps to lower it, it lowers inflammation, it opens up biofilms, and it's a natural chelator of heavy metals. So for those people who don't want to take DMSA, DMPS, CDTA, some of the classic chelators, this is actually one of the natural ones that's been published in the medical literature. So again, how are we improving health? Left side, treat primary sources of inflammation. Not just Lyme, BART, mycoplasma, babesia, all the infections. Go after the biofilms. Go after the persister forms. This is the big thing that's happened to our practice in the last several years since I started playing around with mycobacterium drugs that are used for tuberculosis and leprosy. Detox those environmental toxins, check for heavy metals, check for mold. Two thirds of my patients now are showing up with mold toxins. Ocrotoxins, aflatoxins, gliotoxins are immunosuppressive. They are showing up in some of these patients. So if anaplasm is affecting your immune system, the Babesia is affecting your immunity, and Bartonella is doing it, and Lyme's doing it, you don't want mercury in there causing autoimmune reactions, and you don't want gliotoxins suppressing your immune system. 
And again, we talked about this in the paper that we just published last night. And then we treat the, the downstream effects. So some of the things we're doing is we use compounded medications. And I just want to point out that, well, sometimes, for example, a, a pediatric patient, let's say, can't take a large pill, you can get it compounded lower. But one of the drugs we compound frequently is low-dose naltrexone. And LDN, I'll show you in a second, has been published for Crohn's disease, for multiple sclerosis, okay, it, for fibromyalgia. It's well published in the literature. We use it for Lyme patients all the time. It's compounded. And we're starting to compound, and we don't have the study done yet, methylene blue. Um, the Dapsone study, the newer version, I'm going to tell you about at the end here. Um, I've had 20 minutes or so? What, how much time? Five minutes. And one and a half hour. Uh, let me finish up, and then we'll do maybe 20 minutes. Just have a few more things here. Um, so we compound a lot of medications here. Um, Low-dose naltrexone, DMSA, liposomal formulations. I point this out because at this point, there's a risk now for compounding pharmacists in the United States where they may not be able to do this. There's now laws, they're looking at it from the FDA and other places, and we use compounding medications all the time to help our patients. Part of the reason we also use them is liposomal delivery. So liposomes are very interesting. We want to get into biofilms. So there's some compounders, for example, that make compounded liposomal oregano oil. Dr. Zahn from John Hopkins published on oregano oil, not only helping the biofilms, but hitting the persisters. So we're starting to use this a bit more often. But again, we use LDN, published for Crohn's, fibromyalgia, MS, shuts down those microglial cells in the brain. It also raises endorphin and teflon levels, promotes healing, inhibits cell growth in cancer. There are studies for resistant cancer, this is off topic, but it's been published through actually the National Cancer Institute and Burke Berkson, that LDN orally with IV alpha lipoic acid, there are case studies of reversing resistant breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, whole host of cancers. This is actually published literature. So I actually take LDN in the morning, I'm not obviously doing it again for my family history, but the fact is, is that this drug is useful for many different biochemical pathways in the body, shifting immunity. DMSA we use for heavy metals because the heavy metals you get are stuck in the tissues. You gotta bind them and you gotta pull them into the urine. And this is an FDA approved agent. And when you look at these symptoms of heavy metals and Lyme, they overlap. Can't tell the difference. Probably 25% of my patients, when I pull out the heavy metals, they go, ooh, my fatigue is better, my headaches are better, my memory is better. It wasn't from just the line, right? We had to detox some of these toxins. And then we've got quinolinic acid and endotoxin, actually produced during a Borrelia infection. So when I give someone glutathione, intravenously or orally, and they go, ooh, my brain fog cleared up, possibly that's what I'm pulling out of the body is quinolinic acid. We don't know. We definitely need more research on this, but there is definitely evidence that glutathione is very helpful in a large number of these patients. And it's interesting because I did a study on glutathione 20 years ago, but this just got published um, just last month, actually, or two months ago, um, by the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that intracellular glutathione production goes up 10 times when you have a brilliant infection. So it's kind of like your own pathways know that it's got to upregulate your antioxidants to be able to deal with the oxidative stress that's happening during an infection. And I had done this study through Pat Smith, I published this actually and did this at the LDA years ago on intravenous glutathione where seven out of eight patients who failed antibiotics, we detoxed them. And they said, my fatigue was better, my headaches were better, my brain fog was better, my pain was better. We're probably pulling out some of these inflammatory molecules, but again, we don't know. I'm, I'm guessing at this, more studies need to be done, but it definitely works, that there's no doubt about it and it's safe. So IV and oroglutathione, if you haven't used it, something you definitely want to consider using. And we use N-acetylcysteine, which helps your body to make glutathione, and alpha-lipoic acid, which helps your body to regenerate glutathione while gently pulling out heavy metals. And it's an antioxidant that's both lipophilic, gets into your brain, hydrophilic, gets throughout your body. And then we'll use some herbs for your liver pathways. For example, you'll see glutathione on the left-hand side, You'll see methylation cofactors on the right hand side like methyl B12, methylfolate. Again, there are certain patients, whether they're MTHFR positive or not, they need methylation support. Like my homocysteine was high, I take methyl B12 with folic acid, my homocysteine went all the way down, my body needs methylation support. 
Methyl groups, by the way, are also what are called epigenetic modifiers, meaning they tell your DNA to stay in the straight and narrow. Those four herbs I told you about, curcumin, green tea, um, resveratrol, broccoli seed extract, epigenetic modifiers. That is why I believe that these are very important based on the kind of toxin levels and infections that are getting in. And then we use a lot of phosphatidylcholine and glutathione to start pulling out these mold toxins. And we are finding even with oral regimens, we are able to pull them out. We use compounded pain creams and hormones, and even sometimes compounded antibiotics are for some of these patients. And now we'll finish up by treating the biofilms. So years ago, when we were treating with, let's say, I would call it, let's say, Lyme 101. Oh, Lyme has cell wall forms, cystic forms, intracellular forms. Here's your ceftin for your cell wall forms. Here's your plaquenil grapefruit seed extract for your cystic. Here's your Zithromax for intracellular. Did patients get better? Yes, they did. When I took them off the antibiotics, would they relapse? Most would, yes, unless it was caught early. We didn't know about biofilms. So now, Dr. Zong had just published on oregano. And I highlight oregano because that's the one we're starting to use more in some of the clinical studies, that it's useful against these persisters and biofilms. And Ron was talking about this a bit, so for the clinicians out there and patients that have failed treatments, I don't use one intracellular drug anymore. The rule of thumb is you generally need at least two intracellulars, and I will tell you from personal experience in my worst patients, they need three, they need four, and they sometimes need five. I'm talking about Bartonella. I, I had a woman in the West Coast. She was on 100 milligrams of morphine for 10 years because the neuropathy on her chest wall was so bad she couldn't even wear clothes. She needed morphine. We finally got back a Bartonella fish from Igenix after being on antibiotics for years, meaning it's active, you could find the RNA. We gave her doxycycline and rifampin with dapsone, with pyrazinamide that I'm about to tell you about with gentamicin, used, used for Bart, finally got her off morphine for the first time in 10 years. But it took multiple intracellular drugs to kick these really resistant intracellular bugs. So there's treatment failure because these bugs have now been shown up in the medical literature, in the skin, in the eyes, in the ligaments, in the joints, in the endothelial cells, in your central nervous system, and in biofilms. And you probably saw, most of you who follow the literature, um, Monica Embers had published a great study on macaque monkeys just several months ago showing that there was persistence of Lyme in the macaque by culture, by xenodiagnostics, by PCR, under the microscope, right? She found it in macaque monkeys after 30 days of doxycycline. And they found it also in mice and in humans through NIH studies with Adriana Marquez. And just last week, Marine Middleveen and Ray Stricker published this study that there was positive Lyme, kind of followed what uh, Monica Embers did in the macaque that they could find it by culture, histology, PCR, xenodiagnostics, and guess what? Co-infections were showing up in about 50% of the people like Babesia, Bartonella, and Ehrlichia. So the biofilms are really important. When you have even strep pneumonia, you have pneumococcal pneumonia, right? You don't just hit it sometimes with antibiotics, they will form biofilms. And we're just starting to learn in medicine, the ENT doctors knew this about resistant sinus infections. If you don't get rid of those biofilms, you can't get to some of these bugs that are hiding under the biofilms. It makes them a thousand times more difficult to treat. So Eva Shapi's been doing work in the last several years at the University of New Haven, and Phyllis and I were out there just six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, and she was showing us the slides of the combo. I'm going to show you that doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone, this triple combo, was the most effective as far as lowering biofilms within 72 hours, 50% of the Lyme and biofilms in persister forms were gone. So I started looking at these mycobacterium drugs because when Dr. Ying Zhang from Hopkins published with Kim Lewis that these are persister bacteria, well, I knew that Lyme persisted. But I didn't think of it like a persister like tuberculosis or leprosy. And when I was in residency 35 years ago, I was treating HIV patients with mycobacterium drugs. And I always wanted to use them. I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity because these persisters are showing up in syphilis, biofilm infections, endocarditis, tuberculosis, and leprosy. So Dr. Freeman and I published, this was two years ago, a study, are mycobacterium drugs effective for treatment-resistant Lyme? co-infections, and autoimmune disease. 
This was a woman who had a very difficult to treat autoimmune disease called Bisset syndrome. You could see on the upper left hand side, she had these ulcers, these large ulcers on her tongue. And when you look at her hands, you see how swollen, you see these red nodules kind of at the base. They were calling them Winkleman's granulomas. She failed 19 years of rheumatological drugs from prednisone to everything else and got bad osteoporosis. And once she went on pyrazinamide, it turned out that she cleared her besets. Doxy, rifampin, pyrazinamide, triple intracellular cleared this. But what happened is, is that while we were treating her with Dapsone, her Bartonella showed up. We couldn't find Bartonella for the two years I was treating her. We went into the intracellular compartment to kill the bugs, and all of a sudden her Bartonella turns positive. She gets a positive VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, marker for Bart. Her tularemia titer, low positive, 1 to 20, turns to 1 to 320. We sent her to an infectious disease doctor to make sure he agreed. And her herpes virus 6 titers went up fourfold. She had tularemia, Bartonella, and herpes viruses hiding inside the cells. And I went in there with a triple combo and brought them out. And then she was able to be effectively treated. That same year, we published on the use of Dapsone. This is the first study to be published in the medical literature as a novel persister drug for chronic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. The drug's been out for a long time. They used it for acne, toxoplasmosis, malaria prophylaxis, dermatitis or pediformis. We have over 400 people on the protocol, and it also, what's nice is, it also has effect on Babesia. So as, whereas Mepron and Zithromax, I told you earlier, have resistance, Dapsone is working for them, okay? Not completely, I still need Malarone and Artemisia and Cryptolepis, but it's another tool in the arsenal box, right, for treating this thing, but it's the first regimen. The problem is, of course, is very bad hoaxes. You can get anemia. We usually use these days anywhere between 60 to 90 milligrams of folic acid. <coughs> Rashes, unusual unless you're really sulfur sensitive. The biggest problem is your blood oxygen is normally carried by, in your blood cells by hemoglobin. Your hemoglobin gets oxidized on Dapsone. It's called methemoglobinemia. We're now doing a clinical trial using compounded oral methylene blue to try and keep down the methemoglobin levels because a young man came in to see me, who Phyllis had tugged on my heartstrings a little bit to get in to see me, sick for years, in bed, in his 20s, horribly sick. We put him on the Dapsone protocol. He's on it for three months, he's getting a little better. And then his fourth month, he comes in to see me and I say, how you doing? He says, oh God, I'm terrible. I said, oh, well, what are you taking? I'm taking doxycycline twice a day, I'm taking rifampin twice a day, and I'm taking Dapsone twice a day. I said, Dapsone's once a day. I said, you're taking a double dose. I said, get off all your drugs. He stops the drugs and he comes back a month later and he says, Doc, I'm feeling better. I said, all right, stay off everything. Just stay on biofilm busters. I saw him three weeks ago. He's nine months out without a relapse. He then found out a young woman from the year before accidentally took a double dose of Dapsone. I saw her in the office two weeks ago. She's a year and a half out without a relapse. She used to be in my office all the time. So I gave it to my wife. <laughs> By the way, because she has Lyme disease, not just because I thought, let me just give it to my wife. I love my wife, let's be clear about this. My wife has had relapsing Lyme for 21 years. She probably picked it up on Long Island when she lived there. She's three months out without a significant relapse. I'm doing a clinical trial, and we're going to hopefully do this as a multi-center clinical trial next year. I have to go for an IRB for this one to get this. But we have 75 people enrolled in a slightly different Dapsone protocol. Now, I don't have the long-term results. I have people coming through the protocol, some of the ones I've seen who are four to six weeks out, and we don't put them on antibiotics. This is a seven-week protocol, folks. Seven weeks. That's it. They're then on biofilm busters, they're on stevia, they're on biocidin, okay, they're on oregano oil, that's all they're on. We're finding that this triple biofilm busters with high dose dapsone is doing something different. Next year if they invite me, I'll probably have the paper published by then to tell you what exactly is happening. But we have to definitely deal with the methemoglobinemia. And what we're using now is anyone who has failed prior treatment regimens with Lyme, they're being considered for the dapsone protocol. And when we looked at the statistics, 
it was statistically significant for all the symptoms in Lyme except for headaches in this one. Um, and as I'll show you in a second, the next study we're about to publish actually did help headaches. But we have a lot of problems treating Babesia. So we looked at the effectiveness of Dapsone for Babesia. And you'll see that it actually kind of made the sweats worse for mild, but the moderate and moderately severe and severe got better. In fact, the severe went away. This is at the full dose of Dapsone at 100 milligrams. There's a new study. This is part of what we're going to be publishing that should be out by August to September. We have a new study on 200 patients on Dapsone. The first study, they were on one to four months. These people are on longer. Seven months, some are more than a year. Look at the p-values, even if you don't know too much about statistics, less than 0.001 is statistically significant. And now the headaches have been kicked in this one too. And this third study we're now doing with this different dose of Dapsone may actually be the study that I'm now looking to do as I said, a multi-center, because something different is happening and I'm not quite sure what it is at this point, but it's very encouraging. When we looked at the co-infections on this new study with Dapsone, you'll see that like 80% had Babesia, 50% had Bartonella, we had a couple of Brucella, um, a few Rocky Mountain, Q fever. You're noticing that co-infections are the rule, not the exception. And here's what it looked like when you look on the biofilms. This is from Eva Shopee. The middle one here, Dapsone doxyrifampin, that little green dot, you'll notice it's smaller than all the others. That's because that particular combo was more effective than the other combos of hitting the biofilm forms and the persisters. So we will use herbal combinations, Booner, Zong, Byron White. It's not that we don't use these, we do use them, and sometimes they will keep people in remission after antibiotics, but what I'm now looking at is especially keeping people on multiple biofilm busters like biocidin, liposomal oregano oil, stevia, because they seem to have an effect. It's possible by keeping the biofilms open, if there are a few stragglers, your immune system may be able to better recognize it. This is the study we just published that got released last night on, um, which you can't see because it's cut off on the slides, um, improving a patient with chronic variable immune a deficiency using embryonic stem cell therapy. This is the first case report in the medical literature um, in a patient using embryonic stem cell therapy with Lyme disease who improved. This young kid at 15 years old or 16 when he started thinking about doing this, he had immune deficiency from, you know, he had it since a young age, but they figured it out when he was four years old. 15 infections a year, and even when he went on immunoglobulin therapy, he was still sick. Now his immunoglobulins are completely normal and he's finally weaning off IVIG. The half-life is about 30 to 40 days. He decided because he went to college his first year when kids get sick all the time, he only got one infection this past year in college, probably better than his roommates and everyone else. And his immune system, the immunoglobulins are holding. There's only 25 cases of bone marrow transplants and embryonic stem cells published in the medical literature. Ours is the 26th that is now published, but embryonic stem cells, I've used this, by the way, for ALS patients also where we've seen some clinical results. So in summary, shifting the paradigm for chronic disease. Lyme, multiple co-infections and toxins. They're causing inflammation and immune dysfunction. Look at all 16 differential diagnostic categories. Treat the primary sources of inflammation, multiple infections, environmental toxins, food allergies, leaky gut, wrong bacteria in your gut with dysbiosis, nutritional deficiencies, detox, and then treat the mitochondrial dysfunction, the hormones, balance everything out. This was our Lyme challenge years ago in the office. And I want to thank especially Dr. Freeman and my wife Lee, who's here somewhere, for her support all these years. Because honestly, everything you see me doing here, if it wasn't for a loving, supportive wife who let me work and do what I needed to do, I would not be able to do what I do. So I have to thank her, along with Dr. Freeman and my staff who has allowed me. So thank you so much for your